Five, you are coming with me. It was an explosive combination of comic book action and edgy adult satire. I like it! It inspired a bloody ratings battle over its controversial violence. It's shocking, I would. And it marked the risky American debut of one of the world's most outrageous directors. He's a real devil. <laughs> You are under arrest. How a hero made of metal colored box office gold. The most amazing things that the movie ever got made. On Backstory, Robocop. We're projecting the end of crime in old Detroit within 40 days. There's a new guy in town. His name's Robocop. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Released in 1987, Robocop reinvented the science fiction genre with its bold mixture of action, emotion, and humor. I'd buy that for a dollar. It's a social satire. The social satire masquerading as an action picture. Robocop, who is he? I'd never read anything like it before. It was smart. It was very clever. It had heart. Pretty fancy moves, Murphy. Role models can be very important to a boy. Just a beautifully crafted character who who loses his wife loses his family loses his memory and is used by this giant corporation i think people can relate to that on on, on some level it's life in the big city but before robocop became a worldwide phenomenon it took a brutal battle behind the scenes to get any actor or director to take the movie seriously we couldn't attract flies on this picture uh, well first off i mean the movie is called robocop so right there, about three quarters of the people probably never went past the title page. Robocop was born in 1982, when Ed Neumeyer, a fledgling studio executive and would-be screenwriter, was struck with a vision while wandering past a Warner Brothers movie set. They we're making Blade Runner. And so I asked these, these, these fellows I was working with, what's this movie about? And they said, a cop who kills robots. And that night, I really had an image uh, of, of a robot policeman. What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law. RoboCop was our collective reaction to the Ronald Reagan presidency. We just saw the country moving to the right further and further, and we thought, well, we might as well just move it to the right two steps more, and there we have our world. You've insulted me, and you've insulted this company with that bastard creation of yours. Being a, um, an unrepentant uh, social activist from the 60s, I most enjoyed bringing a kind of chaos to corporate America. But Robocop's cartoonish title soon became a serious impediment for an army of directors who were pursued by producer John Davison. We offered this picture to every director in Hollywood that had ever even come close to a decent movie and nobody would touch it with a 10-foot pole. Eventually, one of Davison's colleagues made a surprising suggestion to send the script to one of Europe's most provocative directors. Dutchman Paul Verhoeven was noted for making dramas packed with social criticism, sex, and strong violence. When Verhoeven got the script, his response was immediate. He hated it. I read it, I tried to read it, and nearly put it down in kind of disgust because the title already was so Robocop, the, the future of law enforcement, it was called. And it was so idiotic and so American. The person that convinced me to do it ultimately was my wife, who picked up that script that I, when we were at the, sitting at the, at, the, at the beach in France for a holiday, <laughs> I'd throw it in the sand, basically. Then so that evening, she, when we were having dinner, she said, oh, well, I read that script. I think you're really misreading that. Verhoeven's wife saw a serious theme of death and resurrection in the story of a futuristic policeman who's fatally shot, then brought back to life by a mercenary corporation. I have always seen dreams about death since I'm 17, 18, basically pretty nightmarish dreams. And that attracted me when I started to realize what was in the script. There was a kind of an execution first, or you could say crucifixion and then a certain kind of resurrection that all intrigued me very much. Verhoeven decided he was ready to gamble on a new career. At age 47, he moved with his family to Los Angeles and immersed himself in American culture. If you want to make American movies, you have to live in the United States. You have to taste the United States. Robocop is really a lot of reflection on my confrontation with American society. It's back. 
big is back because bigger is better. 6000 SUX, an American tradition. Paul was the perfect fit with the project. English is his second language, so he worshipped the script. He would come to us and ask, what does this mean? What does that mean? He was very, very dedicated to doing what was on the page. Verhoeven and his team were equally dedicated to find the right actor to suit up for the title role. Mike Medavoy at Orion had wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie, and they had just done The Terminator. But the problem with Schwarzenegger, of course, is he's a big guy. And the suit, you know, makes you look so much larger because, you know, you're putting on all this padding and these pieces and the harnesses and everything. And, you know, I had to say, Mike, it's going to look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I mean, if you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in the suit. We're also looking for an actor who could not only do the human part, but would also be able to give it this kind of strange, robotic kind of behavior in it, in his walking and in the way he would say his lines. And then the third important thing was, of course, that he had a very good jawline. Perfect, transferring in from Metro South. Peter Weller has a perfect jawline, and his, even his mouth, and that is a little bit sensual. I knew Verhoeven's films. I was an immense fan of Verhoeven. Uh, he wanted me to test. I didn't test. We did a little sort of thing in his office once, but we met many times. But I knew what he was up to. I said, look, this is an action film, but you're making a story of resurrection here. That got him thinking. But not long before filming, another casting struggle arose when actress Stephanie Zimbalist dropped out of the co-starring role of Robocop's human partner, Lewis. We didn't have an actress. And then I remembered that one of the people that came to my office was Nancy Allen. This guy's going to be your new partner. Murphy, meet Lewis. Show him the neighborhood. Glad to know you, Murphy. They said, well, they're changing his title, right? <laughs> and I was sure they would change it, but they didn't. You know, we all thought it was an awful title. We decided to take Nancy on the condition that she would cut her hair very short. We wanted somebody that would not be sexual. Otherwise, you would have always this feeling that the Robocop couldn't do it with her. I ended up with a haircut that wasn't even any kind of a style at all. It was after the fact that it impacted me, and I think I had it close to a mental breakdown. <laughs> Central, this is 154. We're in pursuit of 211 suspect. Request backup. Okay. All right, here we go. With no sex, a minuscule budget, and a director unproven in America, Robocop would have to fight more than murderous street hoods as he now began his violent journey to the big screen. <laughs> See, I got this problem. Cops don't like me, so I don't like cops. <laughs> From the first day of filming, the tight $13 million production of Robocop would be tested to the ultimate extremes. <laughs> Well, of course, I was overwhelmed by language, English language that was not mine, by culture, by the way American television operated. This is Media Break. You give us three minutes and we'll give you the world. One of the big confrontations was looking at the news, because in Holland and in Europe, the most terrible news would not be interrupted by commercials. Now this. Nuka. Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. Yes, it was a day of mourning for the families of 113 people known dead at this hour. It's like they switch over, and that was this kind of abruptness of emotions going wah, and to, to a serious wah, back to fly. Wah, and then, wah, wah, wah. But two weeks into filming, the production was nearly derailed by news that Peter Weller's Robocop costume hadn't yet been finished. We shot everything that didn't involve Robocop first, waiting for the suit. Then there was absolutely nothing left to shoot. So, and it finally arrived on the day that we needed it. It took Peter Weller nine hours to get into the suit. Then the costume didn't fit in any way. He felt like claustrophobic and, and, and paralyzed. And it was like a major disaster because Peter was freaking out and Verhoeven was freaking out. And the whole thing practically collapsed right there. Your move, creep. We had sort of a blow-up that actually I would have been fired for two hours. The next day, you know, I went to Verhoeven's trailer and I said, look, uh, you know, whatever it takes to make it work, we'll make it work. And he said, okay. Over the next days, the crisis passed as Weller adapted to the costume with help from Moni Yakim, a respected teacher of movement from the Juilliard School's drama division. 
Moni said we have to slow this thing down and let the suit work for us. Slowing these movements was a powerful dynamic that gave me a whole new sort of spine, if you will, over this character. This lost guy trying to find out who he was. Uh, hello. I haven't really had a chance to introduce myself. I'm Ann Lewis. Do you have a name? Peter and I had a lot of fun working together. He brought a soul and a heartbeat to that character, and you don't even see his eyes. I mean, even looking at him, there's just this little visor. You can feel the character through all of that. How can I help you, Officer Lewis? Murphy, it's you. I simply approached it as a man who had had amnesia. You really don't remember me, do you? Excuse me. I have to go. Weller's